Hi everybody, I'm Erin Redden and I'm an author. It's a literary suspense book called The Serpent Skin and it kind of twists and turns its way through this mystery. It's about this 10 year old kid, JJ, who's whip smart, feisty little kid. She lives with her sisters and brother and her parents on a very remote farm. But one day her mother disappears and she, none of them know where she's gone and her dad tell, starts to tell a whole stack of lies about it. And she's kind of the troublemaker. She pushes back. She can't, she wants to get to the truth. But her dad, you know, he gaslights these kids. He doesn't let them get anywhere near the truth. So in the end, there's a kind of a sense of the mother doesn't come back. And there's a sense of um, they could be actually, she could be given away. So she has to make a decision as a 10 year old whether her loyalty is going to be to her lying father or her disappeared mother. So in the end she decides I'm going to survive so she shuts up. But 14 years later because we know that it's based on the whole concept of the snake. Snakes shed their skin every year. We humans shed our skin or shed all our cells every seven years. So two cycles later when she's 24 she stumbles across the clue that tells her that all was not well in the house she grew up with, in. And then she really, she won't let go this time, despite everyone telling her to back off, to shut up, to stop making trouble. It's a really a sense of a story about a girl finding a way through and challenging male power to get to the truth. Male power as set up in the patriarchy, but also backed by the church, by the Catholic church. So it's a story about a woman finding herself, despite everyone telling her to stay in a box. It's set on the same farm that I grew up in, in um, North East Victoria. It's a really um, poor house, like there's, the wind would whistle through the, the, the walls of the house. And the reason why I started this novel was because of the house, actually. Um, my brother is a stock agent, we were farmers, and he, um, he was selling one day and this guy, he noticed this old guy waiting for him and the guy waited for hours and when he finished, the man came up to him and said, I was at your house back in the day, in the 60s, because the book, The Serpent Skin is set in the late 60s and then the 80s, and I happened to have taken a photo of your house. Now we, we didn't really have cameras because we were pretty poor, so it was amazing that we had finally had the picture of our house. So my brother was so excited he um, turned it from a slide into a photo, blew it up, framed it, got us all around, and we were all so excited to see our house. And then when we looked at it, just all the kind of, you know, the stirring and the, you know, throwing shade just fell away. And he was the one to say it into the silence. He said, how could the old man have let us live in that? And I really wanted to tell the story about that world. It's not my story, but it is my world. So this is the book, The Serpent Skin. It's put out by Pantera Press. And I really believe that my job is done now, but readers actually do the work as well. We write together, so now it's in your hands. It's not my first book, but I do think, I've got two other books out. One is um, a fiction book, Lilia's Secrets, a novel. And one is a non-fiction book based on my experience of becoming a mother. Um, back, my children have just recently become adults now, but back in the day, no one talked about the, that emotional experience of becoming a mother. And I had been a foreign correspondent. And I'd been, every week I'd go on radio, I was living in Sydney, um, talking about what was, you know, the coups and all the stuff that was going on. And when I was pregnant, I was so sick. So I'd be going in and looking green and, he, and my um, Richard Glover would say, who was the ABC host, well, you know, you're looking pretty sick there. And yeah, I just need a lime splice, I'd say. So when I had the baby, he said, come back and we'll talk about it. And it lit up the board because no one was really talking about the emotional journey of motherhood. And so we went on for two years and he called it Mini 7 Up. And from that, the book came. This is the way that women's careers go as writers. You know, we look at our CV and you go, there's a huge gap there. But in fact, we are doing so much in the world that, that I'm not surprised that me and many other women writers, we just, we, we hold so much. So this is my first book in a long time and I'm, I feel very privileged that there's so much love to support it into the world. I write because I breathe. It's like I'm sure every writer, we, it's, it's actually a hard job 
and what because you don't write once you write you close it and then you write the whole thing again 10 million times because I used to be a journalist so I'm an exaggerator um, and the whole point is that you are you are solving problems all the time and so it's there's a lot of challenge in it however how do you not write when you have when you're called to that world like a scientist is called to science a teacher to teaching it has that same kind of vocational feel I write because I love I love the song of the words together and I really love powerful storytelling and to make that all come together it's like getting all the beats and all the different instruments of an orchestra and how they work together to make something whole and when I get when I hit that right note it is everything and I also write well that's why I write why I write the kind of work I write because I always work with um, how women and girls can live the richest lives I write that because I'm very passionate about how women are tied up in a million knots with the rules that we have to live to and how we have to actually really cut through those in order to live deeper, richer lives. And books were so important in my life. The stories I read as a child, as a young adult, made my life possible. And I want to be part of that for, the, for other people. That is a really tricky question. Um, because 2020 was a long year, especially for us in Victoria and Melbourne. The first lockdown was very hard. I was frightened, to be frank. I was financially frightened and I didn't know where we were going to get money from. So I kind of closed down and I couldn't write because the, when you're in survival mode, it's very hard to actually create the space. When you're busy thinking about where your food is going to come from, you don't really have the time and the space to do the work that means you go into what I call kind of the soul of the universe, which I think is where writing sits. However, that was resolved when the government stepped up, so that was great. So the first lockdown, I, I kind of couldn't do it. But the next lockdown, and they kind of ran together in Victoria, as you know, in Melbourne particularly, I really got my mojo back and I was finishing a PhD as well and my PhD was with another novel so I had to and I was on a deadline so that nothing like a deadline I say <laughs> so um, I worked very hard in the second lockdown and I felt empowered to do that so I was completing a novel and completing my exegesis and my work was around um, girl warriors and ball gowns in young adult fiction so it was pretty fun piece of work to do. I loved it. I, in my mind, I'm a full-time writer. In my pocket, I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> so I do run a business in communication. Um, however, I have been able to organise myself to mostly, 90% of my time, is I get up in the morning, I do what I need to do to keep my mind and body fit, like I meditate and I run. and Because as a writer, you're sitting at your desk, so you really need to make sure that you do the stuff that's going to keep you going. And then I sit down to write. So yeah, most, and I write all day, so I'm pretty lucky. I feel very fortunate to have been able to create a life of like that. I really loved the debut novel by Pip Williams, The Dictionary of Lost Words. And I love it because it works with words. I mean, and lost words. I mean, that is such a poetic idea. And then the way, the way she was managed to twist that through all the characters. I thought she did a beautiful job actually. The book that I think was most significant and the one I loved the most was uh, Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadine Evaristo. What I love is great writing where the sentences really work, married with great stories. And she was able to do that. She doesn't actually use punctuation. I think that's weird, but I hardly even noticed. So she's doing something very interesting, but also what I found really fascinating is because she's telling different stories, at the end you actually realise she's been telling, she's had a very strong through line and you didn't know she was going to get there. I thought it was masterful star storytelling. Also I love the, the fact the world that she took us into. She's, very, she's a beautiful writer. We lived on a farm in which the business of survival came first. So getting your hands on a book was, you know, you had to find corners and secret places to read in. 
I remember the first book I read cover to cover, it was called Heidi and it was in, I read it in the one day because I was sick and I stayed home from school and my parents are farmers so they're off on the farm. So there I was in bed all by myself, it was by Joanna Spiri and I loved the fact that it was a girl doing girl stuff. I mean that, I was only like five or six. Taking, getting taken into a world where girls were the centre of the story just changed my life. I was so proud to have read a whole, whole book as well. And I followed her that up with other books about girls by Nan Chauncey and Mary Grant Bruce, the, the Bushmaid, the Bushmaids, the Little Bushmaid. They're old books, and actually even in my time, they were old books, because that's the kind of books I could get my hands on from generations before, but they were about girls. And that's why I'm so passionate about telling the story because I could find myself, my real self, between the covers of those books in a way that I couldn't in my normal life. And that's what I think real great storytelling does. It helps you discover who you really are. Well, I'm just completing my next literary suspense novel. It's about an outsider girl who goes up against a cult. It's pretty much like there's some um, you know, like I really want to tell, I'm very interested in witches, so I wanted to tell a kind of modern witch story, but one that's, you know, contemporary. So it's about this outsider girl who's ostracised because she kind of knows the secrets of, she knows too many secrets, and then she discovers the biggest secret of all. She comes across a dead baby under the ice, and that just starts everything, because of course people are going to think she's implicated, and then it unfolds into a much greater crime. Uh, which is the kind of thing involved with the local cult and that's the kind of thing I'm really interested in. You think it's one crime but actually there's deeper darker things going on. So it's been really great to talk with you all and I'm so grateful to The Leaf for encouraging great storytelling in Australia. Thank you.